So, welcome everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I joined IID three, four months ago, um, having worked with the UK government. And what's bizarre is having been negotiating for the UK government, I've never actually been to a COP before because we had a restriction on numbers. So, this is my first time at the DNC days. So I've been hearing so much about them over the years. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, oops. I'm going to need technical help. Pablo. If there's a problem, it's likely related to me. <laughs> just push the space Just button. push the space bar. Okay. So, this, this, this group of people, which I haven't joined, but I've been observing from a distance, this, this DNC community of practice is, is something very special, I think. Um, and the, uh, the opportunity is, I think, to begin to, to recognise ourselves more, more formally as a community of practice. Um, and what's so exciting is that this list of um, partners that um, um, uh, that um, Martin was talking about earlier, they are doers. Most most of the organisations are out there actually trying to work out how to how to address climate change on the ground, how to do this practically. So this is an opportunity um, for for this group and the rest of us who, who are um, beyond this group, to, to start to formalise and say, OK, so we've, we've been working on these areas. How's it going? What's working? What's not? Um, and try and move beyond the sort of rhetoric of, of we, need to do, we need to tackle climate change. Um, this is it. And one of, the, uh, one of the things, actually, that I wanted to point out also is I understand we mean business by joining us this time. This is the first time we've had the private sector here as well. And that's obviously hugely important, as if we're going to, we need to be working with the private sector to get the private investment in. So if we're a community of practice, this sort of learning pathway you've all seen before, um, it's, it's an opportunity for us to be iterating our learning and, and working at the global and the national and the local level and understanding how that learning can feed up. This is going to be an open and safe space. We're nurturing ambition and innovation and trying to re reward learning irrespective of whether, um, of whether it's success or failure. But this is really also very vital for delivering the ambition of Paris. Now this hugely complicated slide is trying to summarise what we've got to do over the next um, 20 years. So we start with um, the far left, we've got Paris agreed, but every country set out its um, ambition, its pledges, in slightly different ways, over different time frames, and um, it's very hard for us to get our heads around. So what Marrakesh is seeking to do is try and bring a level of guidelines and agreements about the rules of how we report on climate change. And um, what's so important is that this is also an opportunity for learning. If we can begin to all set out in the same ways, you know, here's the success here, then other countries can go, ah, you're doing that, let's have, why don't we try that as well? So if we can get these, um, and at the bottom, this is us, this is the, the, the observers and the doers, and, uh, We've got to sort of push our governments to build their ambition every five years. So one of the things that um, the negotiators for the LDC group and, 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 and wider, the sort of developing countries, are hoping to do is get, just get a simple agreement that we have um, synchronised pledges every five years. And that will help sort of allow us all to focus on those particular moments when we really push our governments and say, look, this is what we're doing on the ground, this is what works, do more of it, replicate it. Um, and the idea also is that um, we ask the governments to set out their pledge, their, their firm plan for five years, but set out an indicative future five years to so give a bit more forward look to the businesses and, and um, governments that are investing in infrastructure and those longer term decisions. So if we can get this right, um, that's fabulous. We begin to move up in ambition, push um, our uh, ambition up to that 1.5 degree um, uh, um, aspirational target, but for that, for all of these steps to happen, governments need confidence. Yes, they need to know that this is possible, that they can do it, and that's what we need to be able to show them is how you do it. So the real, the real emphasis, I guess, on this community practice is not just pushing to help the governments say that they'll do more, but showing them that we can do more, and this is how it's done. So, where are we in the negotiation? So, we've, um, in IID, we have colleagues who are supporting the LDC group. Um, 
and uh, I got a brief last night. So this is a summary of where we are over the, over the last week. Um, the Marrakesh theme was implementation, but in fact, because of the early entry into force, um, the conversation is much less about the implementation and much more about the procedural, how are we going to negotiate the rules of, of the Paris Agreement. Um, it's a challenge to do that because some countries have ratified, others haven't quite yet. Who's allowed in the room to negotiate those, those deals? It's, it's really a question of um, the CMA, which is the decision-making body. Do, are they suspended for one year or two? Um, the LDC group is saying just suspend for one year and then agree some decisions. The developed countries are saying, no, we, we should do it all. All the decisions have to be agreed together. So those are the sorts of things that are going on at the COP at the moment. The, the ch huge challenge around these climate negotiations is all the issues interrelate. So how do you sequence them? How do you, how do you get the right balance between the different issues so that the developing countries' interests are there as well as the push for the developed countries to do more? Um, I'm, I've really tried to simplify the rules that they're discussing. It was about five pages of brief that, um, uh, that it sort of summarises at a very high level, and I've tried to get it into a few lines. But basically, everyone's agreeing these review mechanisms. That's the, that's the sort of global stock take, the NTCs, when communications happen, and trying to get this synchronised pledge and review that I spoke to earlier, the five plus five. Five years of firm plans, five years of us of, of sort of um, indicative plans, um, and trying to get the global transparency um, agreements uh, there. Some of this is around compliance. Some of it's around you know, do we actually believe um, that what we're doing is enough? The global stock take needs to be able to tell us whether everyone's joined up ambition actually adds up to what's needed. But the, it's not just about action, and a lot of the discussions in the COP are always around the mitigation, which of course is vital. But we also need to be assured that the finance is flowing as it's been promised. We need to be assured that adaptation is being supported in the way that it should. Um, so getting that balance is a lot of what the LDCs are pushing for at the moment. And then the, um, the, the, there are no, the, the Paris uh, rules are all about uh, facilitating implementation rather than about compliance. But there needs to be some level of, do we, do we actually think that people are doing what they've said? Um, and then an issue that has yet to arise, but I think is incredibly important for all of us, in the negotiations they're always talking about the global level, but to get real action summarise at the global level, we need to be clear what's happening at the national level and at the sub-national level, the local level. And so I think there's a real opportunity for us as a, as a community of practice to be supporting downward accountability so that at a national level, the donors are telling the governments, this is what finance we're giving you and this is what it's for. Does it fit with your priorities? And at the local level, the national governments and the donors are saying, this is the finance available, how do you want to use it? So um, trying to pull that downward accountability into the debate, I think, is really important. I don't want to go through all of this. It's enormous. But all of the different things that's being discussed, I've covered some of them. The mitigation communications, how do we get more uniformity in how the governments are expressing what they're going to do on mitigation, and provide enough flexibility for the LDCs, because these, um, uh, these processes of... Um, Summarising on greenhouse gas stock take is incredibly technical and, and hugely resource intensive. Um, on adaptation communications, big questions around, you know, there's a lot of countries that have already started developing their national adaptation plans. How does that fit with the NDCs? How do we bring it all together? Um, and again, the opportunity to capture what's working. So rather than make it all about compliance, you've said you'd do this, have you done it? Make it much more about this is what's working really well so that other countries can begin to adopt those same practices and try and do that in a way that doesn't have a massive reporting burden. Um, climate finance, there's a huge credibility gap. It's been there forever now. The, the donors say we're giving this amount of money. The countries aren't really seeing it on the ground still. Um, the, the donors have set out the uh, roadmap to 100 billion, but the LDC group's very disappointed on the level of detail. It's all about sort of, you know, we will do this sort of very broad terms rather than the, rather than the mechanisms of actually where the finance is going to flow and how, which um, funds it's going to go in. Um, there's, a, there's an element of flexibility and reporting for the least developed countries, but they're saying don't just give us flexibility of reporting and leave us out, we actually want the support in order to be able to report on how much financing is really coming to us. 
Um, on the adaptation target, um, the roadmap says that they're going to double the finance. This is still only, even with a doubling um, by 2020, it's only 27%. Now some donors, the UK and um, the GCF and a couple of others have said that they're about 50%, they're going to be 50% on adaptation. Sh shouldn't we see more donors trying to achieve that sort of level? And then the, the really big issue is that the, um, the, the finance that is flowing is all flowing for energy and for, well, all, I'm exaggerating enormously, but a lot of the finance is going for mitigation in the middle income countries. And so the LDCs, the SIDs, are fairly saying, it's not coming to us, but what mechanisms can help us actually begin to be, bring this finance in? And so they're pushing for the adaptation fund to be given a greater role, become a mechanism of the um, Paris Agreement, and for the LDCF, um, the least developed country fund, to be given um, new uh, ambitions. On gender, very good news, there's basically consensus that um, the LEMA working, um, working group should continue and promote gender responsive programming. And this of course is hugely important for the type of work that we're all involved in. Um, so great that that's getting proper recognition. Um, on capacity development, um, conversations are really just beginning, but one of the opportunities I think is underneath the, um, the push for the LDCF to be, to be much more about building the capabilities of the poorest countries to build a project pipeline that can get investment. Um, but the push to move away from the fly-in, fly-out TA and try and build the mechanisms that actually provide that long-term capability in country. And then on loss and damage, um, the limits of adaptation are there. We're all in this group, I'm sure, very aware of it. Um, so big questions about how that's handled and whether it's part of the re review mechanism for um, Paris. So there you go, that's the, um, that's the summary of the negotiations. Sorry to be taking you through it so fast with so much text. But just to illustrate this credibility gap, um, just 8% um, of climate finance has been dispersed to date. So that, the top line is how much has been pledged, the next line is how much has actually gone into the funds, the next line is how much has been approved, and then that final line is actually how much has got out to country and doing anything right now. Um, and what, uh, what we're also seeing is that, um, uh, as I said earlier, 95% of the finance for the public finance for energy is going to the middle and high income countries, just 5% to the low income countries. Um, and on the right, what you can see here is that 50% uh, is going to sort of on grid energy, just 9% for the sort of off grid decentralised energy that actually can reach the poorest rapidly. So whilst we know a lot of what, we ha what works and what will really make a difference in poor people's lives and really know that the low-income countries need the finance most, actually the finance is not flowing in the right ways yet. So this um, uh, credibility gap is huge. Um, so, we've got Paris. But it's not a blank sheet. We've all been working on climate change for some time now. The climate finance has been around since it was uh, formally agreed at Copenhagen. And a lot of it, we've learned a lot. We're not starting with a blank sheet. So we can learn from the mistakes of the past. Um, we know that uh, if, if the finance comes in a more flexible way and local people are engaged in deciding how it should be used, you get, you get all sorts of co-benefits, the agile institutions that can be responsive and react to different things. Um, we've also seen a lot of um, governments set up their own um, national climate funds and have seen how that has nudged development finance in different ways to, to, to focus more on what will make a bigger difference for resilience. We've also learned a lot about the importance of long-term plans and then developing a pathway of how to get there. So the climate change strategies a lot of governments have set up over the last few years really begin to give a longer-term view and, and start to work with the sectors on how to get there. And there's all sorts of interesting work that's been trialled in, in different places around energy futures under things like the, um, the MAPS programme, um, around land use, around more coherent risk management. So we can we can start with what's working already. We also have to increase the quality of learning and try to get that iteration so that we can, um, we can share what's working much more rapidly and, and move the debates forward. Um, it's important to support that through more locally owned processes. And choosing, being politically astute, choosing when to work with the grain or when to try and develop a new narrative. And these are all, these are all mechanisms for creating a, 
a much greater um, ambition within the countries um, with whom we, we partner, or building much broader coalitions to, to demand for the policy changes that are needed. So I guess the biggest sort of message from Paris is with everyone focusing on the NDCs right now, let's not get caught in a, in a, in a spiral of just master planning and trying to get the perfect plans right. Let's really focus on what works and have that delivery focus in our minds when we're planning. Um, I'm, I'm really not going to go through this, I'm just putting it up to say that, you know, supporting the NDCs, there's an awful lot to learn from the PRSPs, the NAMAs and the NAPAs. And that experience um, can really be um, uh, brought together with a much more, you know, how do we support governments to build their own planning processes and, and understand what's working. And there are all sorts of ways of doing it, and these are some of the tactics, but I'm not going to go through them. I can share the slides afterwards if you're interested. Um, we also... Uh, oops. Sorry. Um, we also, uh, as I've said already, know a lot more than, than we did 10 years ago, 8 years ago, around what climate-informed poverty reduction looks like. Um, we know that more variable climate change makes getting people out of poverty and staying out of poverty, escaping poverty in a sustained way, harder. Um, and we need to be better at expressing that to our development colleagues. Um, we know that climate positive development can be, um, can be brought about through a set of instruments that can both reduce poverty and enable adaptation. And really exciting work in a number of countries around shock responsive social protection, around contingency finance and insurance that's triggered by forecasts, and you know, automation of decision processes so you're not waiting for donors to make up their minds. Um, we know lots about how to build resilient local economies, whether that's in terms of jobs or markets or livelihoods. And we know that decentralisation can offer a huge opportunity for building locally agile, local institutions that are agile and climate aware. We also know a lot about what is um, poverty reducing mitigation. So all this off-grid renewables um, can democratise en energy, get energy out to households much more rapidly. And there's all sorts of work around the cities as well about how to plan them in a pro-poor way, um, pro-poor transport and um, housing, and that, that also reduces their energy demands. And hence the DNC themes, which um, I think are enormously exciting. Um, if these themes um, can begin to capture all of that experience of, of th this community of practice and set it out for the governments that are struggling with how do we, what do we prioritise, what do we do first, what should we have in our NDC investment plans. Um, so there's um, the opportunities to discuss the action towards the Paris ambition. What, um, what are the ambitious and pragmatic, politically feasible climate solutions? Um, what's innovative and helps catalyse that climate leadership that we need to see? And then around the just and equitable decision making, the role of the different um, parts of society in how to promote this transparency and accountability, but really looking at what, what um, builds equity and just um, decision making. So what will create that downward accountability? And then in the managing climate risks, this innovation around the, the divide, the climate humanitarian divide and how that's brought together. And there's, there's so many um, examples of actually how do you do that in this room now. Um, so we can move beyond just saying we must do it to this is how you do it. These are the practical steps. And the opportunity for this group's learning to then feed into the, um, the next event, um, which will be the community-based adaptation conference with uh, which is being hosted with Makarera in Uganda, ICAD and Makarera's um, uh, a partnership. Um, again, bringing together a very similar group, but much more focused perhaps on the, um, on the sort of NGOs and the, and the national level governments um, who won't be so busy in the negotiations, hopefully, um, and follow these themes through. And then, hopefully, we'd, we'd really like to see that as they've iterated these themes and thought more and tested some of the ideas that have come out of this group, they can come back up to the DNC days next year. So, if you've got ideas about how the themes should develop or how they should be nudged or shaped to be more relevant and more practical and more useful, then, then do let us know at the end of these days. Great. Thank you very much. Excellent.